And for your foreign language general education requirement, we introduce you to the Wittig reaction. I know it's spelled with a W, but it's not the Wittig reaction, it's the Wittig reaction. And what a reaction it is. Here's where we're at. Where we're at. We've gone through a whole slew of nucleophiles adding to that great new carbon electrophile we've learned, the carbonyl. And the latest nucleophile we learned was organometallics, the alkyl lithiums in the Grignard. Illids are also carbon nucleophiles that are anionic. They are kind of odd, and you'll understand why as we go through this mini lecture. So it's illid, illids, and the reason they're illids, or the definition of an illid, is a carbon with a negative charge on it by virtue of the fact that it is attached to another atom right next door that has a positive charge on it. That's an illid. And you may think, boy, that's a pretty bizarre looking character, but actually you're full of it. I mean, we're, we all have illids in them. This is a structure of thiamine pyrophosphate, and as you, it's a vitamin B1 derivative and a cofactor that catalyzes quite a few biological reactions. And what you can see here is that there's an illid right there in this naturally occurring molecule. Because of that positively charged nitrogen, it's not at all difficult to deprotonate that hydrogen. So that gets deprotonated, giving that negative charge right there, and you've got an illid, and that can go on to do wonderful things in biological systems. Well, we aren't as clever as mom nature, but we have come up with our own versions of illids, and the first one we're going to learn about in this mini lecture is a phosphonium illid. That's the key reagent in the Wittig reaction. And in the next mini lecture, we'll look at a sulfonium illid. Just a big overview here, the Wittig reaction converts a carbonyl into an alkene. So what you are going to see right here is that I am I'm making another carbon bond. I'm making a carbon-carbon bond and changing that carbonyl into an alkene. In the sulfonium illid reaction, I am making another carbon-carbon bond as well. This guy right here. But in addition, in some kind of magical organic chemistry, we get an epoxide out of the deal. Both of them. Keep in mind, the illid is a strong, good carbon nucleophile. You are thinking C minus. And they have a great affinity for the carbonyl electrophile. All right, so Wittig, here he is. Georg Wittig won the Nobel Prize for this chemistry. There's three parts to it. First part we're going to look at is the reaction. The reaction itself is, like I said, converting a carbonyl to an alkene. So it's kind of like the opposite of ozonolysis. Here I have a carbonyl. Here I have a Wittig. And it's as if I'm just going to put these two, shush, smush them back together again. And I lose this and I lose that. So this is the piece that gets plunked on to the carbonyl. So right here I have delivered that CH2 to the uh, carbonyl, the ketone carbonyl. Pretty cool. Now, this is very broad. We can do this to all kinds. We can do it to aldehydes and ketones very easily. I ha happen to be using the same illid in these two examples, but note that I'm drawing two different versions of the same illid. The beauty of the illid is that we can draw that resonance contributor because the phosphorus has d orbitals. So I am not violating the octet rule when I'm looking at that version of the illid structure. 
So that's all it does. It turns a ketone or aldehyde into an alkene. So that's part one. Part two is the mechanism. How does this work? Okay, well, it's going to be a lot easier to visualize if we focus in on this version of the illid, because then it's pretty easy to see the kind of the expected electron movement, where my C minus attacks my carbonyl carbon and kicks that guy out onto the pi electrons out onto the oxygen, just as we would expect. So that gives me this intermediate, and what you can see by looking at that intermediate is that I have an O minus and a P plus. And remember that phosphorus has d orbitals. So I'm just going to basically redraw, move that uh, carbon phosphorus bond 90 degrees. So what you're seeing right here is I'm just showing that, gee whiz, my oxygen is right next to that phosphorus, and so it can just slap down and make a phosphorus oxygen bond. So that happens to give you this four membered ring with a phosphorus and an oxygen in it. Now there's some crazy organic nomenclature in the Wittig reaction. This intermediate is called not a betaine which is very embarrassing if you say that to somebody who knows organic chemistry. It's, that's a terrible way to spell it, but that's the way it's spelled, but it's really a beta-ene, okay? So the first intermediate, this guy right here, is called a beta-ene, and then when it slaps together to make you make that five member, four membered ring, you have an oxophosphatane. So those are some cool words to throw around to show how much you're learning. A betaene and an oxophosphatane. Well, that oxophosphatane doesn't stick around. That oxophosphatane has a really fantastic driving force, which is, woomph, woomph, the formation of a phosphorus oxygen double bond. So really, any oxygen doubly bonded to an element is a super, super strong bond. That's a thermodynamic driving force to make, you know, CO is a strong bond, SO is a strong bond, but phosphorus oxygen bond is like a rock. Yeah, literally, it is a rock. So that's the driving force for this reaction. That takes us all the way to the product, and the product that we want, of course, is not this guy, we don't care at all about that, that's triphenylphosphine oxide. What we want, of course, is our organic bit, and that is pretty great, because especially this is an exocyclic double bond on the outside of the ring, and those are pretty darn tough to make using any other method besides the Wittig. All right, so a quick example here, they all Wittigs are um, not alike, not all illids are the same. So what you can see here is that we have a two carbon piece. And so I put that two carbon piece onto my carbonyl and there it is, making an alkene. What you should notice here though is that when my mechanism proceeds, I can uh, have the ox oxophosphatane collapse to give not just this product, <clears throat> what else? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Got it? I should also be expecting to get that isomer, okay? And the stereochemistry of the Wittig is actually, really is beyond the scope of this class. We're not going to talk about it. Um, so just count that you would probably get a mixture of both the E and C alkene in this example. All right, well, the third part of the Wittig we're going to talk about is how do you make these Wittig reagents? And you know what? The best part of this is it's all old stuff. The first part is just an SN2. We've got a good nucleophile right here, and we know this old-fashioned carbon electrophile has a leaving group on it, so 
addition of, say, triphenylphosphine, and it doesn't have to be triphenylphosphine, it could be trimethylphosphine, it's just triphenyl is probably the cheapest and easiest to use. So triphenylphosphine plus, uh, say, uh, methyl chloride or something like that, you get the salt. So here's my salt, my phosphonium cation, and my X minus anion, that makes a salt. Alright, so I first get the phosphonium salt, and then the second step is just acid base. Whatever my phosphonium salt is made up of, I just have to make sure I have a hydrogen here that can be removed. Because as long as that hydrogen is there, it can be removed by a base to give me my illid. There it is. So, preparation of the vinegar agent, absolutely same old, same old stuff we've seen over and over again. One more example. Take this nifty ester. I think that would be methyl acetate or methyl ethanoate. And I want to convert it to this guy. I want this guy with the leaving group on the alpha carbon. Do you remember how to do this? Hmm. Well, remember that alpha hydrogens are acidic. That makes my carbon, my alpha carbon, nucleophilic. So it makes sense that my electrophile would be bromine, because I've seen the bromine electrophile a lot. So I'm going to add Br2, but how do I go from just the plain ester to the alpha bromo ester? Well, you'll do that under acidic conditions, and this is so, oh, gee whiz, I don't know, this is way back in, in uh, first semester OCHEM. Uh, but basically, I can convert this guy into the enol under acidic conditions, and it reacts with bromine to give you the alpha bromo ester. Once I have the alpha bromo ester, well, yeah, I can just kick out my leaving group to make my phosphonium salt. Here's the counter ion, Br minus up there. Now what do I need to do? Now I need to deprotonate it. So what should I use to deprotonate it? Well, there's all kinds of different possibilities. Um, one good possibility, especially when you have a an alpha hydrogen like this that's next to a carbonyl, that's going to be pretty easy to remove because of the carbonyl. So I think we can just add potassium butoxide. So my base here just comes along and rips off that hydrogen to make my illid. And then my illid can react with whatever I want it to. In this case I'm throwing in an aldehyde and now what I'm showing you is that this whole piece is what is getting added to give me my Wittig product. So there is what was the carbonyl, and here is, this is the CH2 that corresponds to this guy. Alright, I'm lying, that is not the CH2 that corresponds to this guy. This guy corresponds to that guy. Alright, so then what do I have? Well, then I have this attached to this, and that is my product. And what you should be asking yourself is, well, no, wait a minute. Is this going to be E or Z? And again, the stereochemistry of the Wittig is beyond the scope of this class. But this kind of illid typically gives doo -doo -doo, the E alkene. So pretty slick. That's where my aldehyde was. That's the new carbon carbon bond I made. Alrighty. So the Wittig makes alkenes from carbonyls. We'll learn in the next mini lecture about the sulfonium illid, which is 
has a completely different outcome, but does make a carbon-carbon bond and makes an epoxide at the same time. Very cool. But first, what did one ocean say to the other ocean? Nothing. They just waved. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, that's all enough of this. See you in class.